The KC 135. This thing can pump more gas in eight minutes than a gas station can pump in 24 hours. About a thousand pounds a minute can flow out of this boom. I spent many an hour behind this thing, in the wake, in the turbulence, on the outskirts of thunderstorms, just sitting there hoping that I would be done refueling because it's a bit more challenging than I ever thought it would be. I refueled in the F-15E and in the F-16, and today I'm gonna walk you around this 135 and just tell you some of the things I noticed from refueling underneath it and to give a shout out to the tanker community for refueling me and keeping me from being in a position where, let's just say I couldn't just pull my jet over to the side of the road if I ran out of gas. It'd be a little more dramatic than that, as you can imagine. So I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the channel. My name's Ryan. Neo, this is the Max Afterburner channel, and we're gonna be walking around the 135. We've got a, a F-35 up there right now, and who knows, it may have just gotten done refueling by the 135. I'm here at the Hill Air Force Base Museum in Salt Lake City, Utah. If you haven't been here before, this place is incredible. So I'm gonna walk you around this 135 and just show you the things I noticed, the details I noticed, and give you a perspective of what it would be like to be in a fighter jet below one of these things. Here we go. And I gotta give a shout out. We got the F-15E. I don't know if you can see it, but it's coming in right now. That's actually what I was in. I was in the F-15E as I was refueling from this monster. So it brings back some good memories just sitting down here because we actually had references that we would use that would put the engines that you can see behind me on certain parts of the canopy bow. And that was the way that we would initially line up. So we would start moving in from behind the 135. And I know the, sh the sun's going in and out of the camera lens, but that's exactly how it was in your eyes. As you were coming in to refuel, the sun would be shining in and then it would not. So it, it would change the shadows and it would change the way that you had to move in behind this aircraft because if the sun's shining directly in your eye and you can't see anything, you gotta pause right where you're at and stay exactly in that space wait for the shadow to come back in so you can actually see something and then move forward. So it'd kind of be a move like this. You'd be coming in slow, you'd be coming in fast, 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 and then you'd kind of park it right in a position about here. We would be lower though. We'd be in a position somewhere below those tires with this boom fully extended down. And that's where you would roll into, and that's called the pre-contact position. You'd roll into that spot and then you would move it in even closer, slowly, and you would basically wait to hear communications from the boom operator. Those communications would be 15 feet, 10 feet, five feet, three, two, one, contact. And you get contact somewhere probably back here because what you're not seeing is there's an actual extension part of the boom that comes out of this flying wing behind the 135. So that's gonna extend even further down and give you the ability to be a little bit lower so you're not as close, especially to the wake. So being able to get that boom to extend down and then plug you was just huge because you could get out of the wake that's coming off of this massive aircraft. I mean, in a fighter jet or a small aircraft, you wait two minutes after a heavy aircraft takes off to dissipate the turbulence that comes from behind the wing. So imagine flying behind it. Some of the most intense missions that I was in was interrupted or I had to go to the tanker to get gas because of fuel state. So being able to do it quickly and get in that position fast was partly my responsibility, but it was partly the boom operator's responsibility. And there were some sharp boom operators. So the crew of this thing are two pilots, sometimes a navigator, typically not a navigator, and then a boom operator. The boom operator lived up in this window right here. So in that window, they would be up in there watching and flying in that wing that I told you about into the fighter jet. So they're gonna be sitting up in here. Here's kind of what their perspective would be like. You'd be up there, the boom would drop down and then you would just be waiting for the fighter to roll in. And then you're basically flying a little airplane with this flying wing and the winglets behind this aircraft right into a receptacle in the fighter jet. Now, the Air Force claims that this boom is strong enough to actually plug in and pull a jet. I don't know. I never saw anything like that happen. No like Pardo's push type situations that I experienced. Uh, and I think the main reason is that boom is pretty fragile. If you tried to pull or yank or you did anything that was sudden, you could actually rip the nozzle off of 
the top of that boom. And if everybody else in your formation hadn't gotten gas yet, you can imagine you weren't the uh, favorite pilot once you got done with that mission. So this is kind of the business end of the 135, and this is where it all happens. So rolling in behind it in the F-15E, the receptacle in the F-15E is to the side. It was to my left side. So you'd actually see the boom pass down the canopy and then plug in. And the F-16, it's actually behind you. So that one was a little more tricky to me because it's just, there's just something weird. It feels like you're doing a backflip and you're watching the boom come in over your head and you have to resist the temptation to keep looking at it and pull up. You have to watch it pass, let it go behind you so you don't pull up into a position that's unsafe underneath the tanker. And then once you do that, you're plugged in and then you're just sitting here. You're getting about 910 pounds a minute. So let's say you're trying to get about 15,000 pounds from the tanker, you're gonna be sitting there for 15 minutes. So as you can see, this is an operation. This is something that you really gotta be on your game for and be prepped for. Now, heavy pilots do the same thing. The AWACS can aerial refuel, B-52, B-2. I can't imagine. I mean, I just gotta give props to that because it's a less maneuverable aircraft and a lot of times it was tough in a fighter, which is extremely maneuverable and the power was extremely responsive. So got to give credit where credit's due. Someone in a B-52, like this thing over here behind me, aerial refueling, you got to have some serious cojones. Absolutely. All right, let's roll in. We'll do a quick walk around of this thing and we'll just kind of look at it from a top perspective. Now, as you look down the bottom, there's a series of lights and we'll get up there and get closer to them. But as you plug in to the receptacle, the boom operator is flying it into your receptacle. Then you look at these lights and there's an up down on the left side and a forward back on the right side, if I remember correctly. And you're gonna you keep this line on a certain point on your aircraft. So with the F-15E, it was a little different. With the F-16, it was a little different, but those lights are basically like stop lights. Like you'll see a red light if you're extremely low. You'll see the yellow light if you're kind of relatively in the middle and then you'll see the green light once you're on target, once you're ready to go. And the thing is with those things is you can imagine an old aircraft flying around since the 60s, those lights are not as sharp. They're not the LED lights in your headlights on the new cars. They're basically dim. So if, it, if the sun shines on them as well, now you're really in a position where it's gonna be tough. So just kind of a, a really solid airframe. I mean, the fact that this thing has been around for as long as it's been around is, is super impressive to me. So when it comes to the range of this thing, you're looking at somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000 miles if it's giving away its gas. So if it's, it can carry about 150,000 pounds of receiver fuel. I mean, that's just insane. <laughs> so 150,000 of, of 150, pounds of receiver fuel, and then also you're taking that 2,000 miles, so incredible there. You've got the big trucks, so you see the big trucks. Potentially, you know, maybe a little overkill for if it was just an aircraft carrying passengers or something like that. But 150,000 pounds of fuel on top of this thing, you're looking at somewhere, I would, I would say around 320,000 pounds would be the weight that you would get out of these things. So that's with, you know, a little bit of cargo that you could have on it and 150,000 pounds of gas and then the airframe structure itself, the engines, all that different stuff. The power plants had about 20,000 pounds each of thrust. So not an extremely overpowered aircraft. I'm talking to some of the pilots that I've known, just not a very power friendly aircraft. You gotta make sure you stay ahead of the power curve and you're not relying too much on power. If you get slow, high or something like that, you're gonna have to descend. So you really gotta pay attention to the speeds you're flying it at. All right, so we'll take a quick peek at the landing gear. Again, extremely strong landing gear, just making sure that you've got the metal to carry all that gas. Just impressive. Wow. We'll continue moving around the side here, and I'll show you these lights as we get closer. Sorry for the rocks. Can we get these rocks removed, please, so they're not making any noise in my video? <laughs> Hopefully they're not too loud. All right, just the front of the aircraft here. Obviously this is a display model, so the engines are gonna be blocked off. And then we'll take a peek down below at the lights. All right, so this is where the lights would be. They'd be in a position down here. Looks like some of these have been removed, but this panel is gonna be up at a position where you can actually see what you need to do, up, down, left, right. Jets flying over, how rude. Don't they know I'm shooting a video down here? 
All right. Air mobility command. This is kind of cool. May we never forget, just a nice emblem, just a nice remembrance on the side of the 135. I'm a big fan of nose art, so as I do these walk-arounds of the aircraft, hopefully more of these here at the Hill Air Force Base Museum, I'm just gonna talk a lot about the nose art and a lot about the history. So, and still they serve, it's just a beautiful remembrance of you know, the prisoners of war and those who never made it home. So I always think it's cool to have history intertwined. Nice view of the side of the aircraft. Just a solid looking aircraft. Here you've got an inlet for Ram Air. And then just a look again at these strong, beefy landing gear. Same type of landing gear that you'd see like on a 767 or something like that. Just two trucks, you know, having all that space. You got the flaps, typical of a larger airframe. So this one's from the Utah Air National Guard, and who knows, maybe this bad boy passed me some gas uh, in combat uh, while I was on the Thunderbirds. So big shout out to all those involved in the tanker community, all the refuelers out there, and uh, grateful for you guys and gals for what you've done and what you continue to do. And here's a nice shot again of what the position is when you're refueling. So thanks for watching guys, really appreciate you. Check out another video, we'll catch you on the next video. Have a great day.